are listening to Cemetery Confessions, the world's number one goth talk podcast. Hello and welcome back to Cemetery Confessions. This week we are chatting with Kate Muir, who runs Bone and Busk, a high-end bespoke fashion line that you can find at boneandbusk.com, as well as Etsy and some other places. Of course, I'll have links to those in the show notes as always. Kate is also a performance artist and goth DJ in Toronto. If you've been listening to the show for a little while, I've previously bemoaned the use of the sartorial idioms of goth within hot couture and other runway fashion. Most notably and most recently would be our episode titled Goth Runway Fashion and Postmodernism. However, I am but an ignoramus when it comes to matters of fabric, so I'm thankful to have an expert with us today. We are going to cover a range of topics relating to the relevance of the runway season and the runway cycle as it connects to goth, uh, and we'll touch on some ancillary topics such as fast fashion and ethical consumption. So as always, I am The Count, and I'm here with my co-host Trey. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Let's start at the beginning. When did you realize you were a goth? I think my first introduction to goth subculture was probably in the early to mid 90s. My sister was into light alternative music. She was kind of more on the fluffy side of the cure and that kind of stuff. Um, But I kind of gravitated towards more of the darker stuff. So I would probably say grade six is when I kind of Mm. fell into it. And I started to dress a little bit more alternative, kind of stole my dad's leather trench coat and, you know, (laughs) saw the crow for the first time and was kind of uh, charmed by that. And, uh, you know, about the time I hit high school, I was already really super into it and had gravitated towards a friend's group that were, you know, also like minded. And so we shared musical Mm. interests and that kind of thing. So, um. Yeah, I mean, I went to Catholic school, so, you know, uh, and I was also, like, excommunicated (laughs) when I was younger. Um, So uh, it it, it felt like a natural kind of uh, thing for me to gravitate towards. Since we're talking about fashion, then, how did that factor into being goth? Did you discover a passion for sewing and that kind of thing because you got into the scene, or was that, like, a whole separate deal? Oh, definitely fashion was a huge part of it. I think, um, you know, when you're in grade six and you're, you know, you're, you're kind of visually, I mean, I was visually stimulated. I loved art. Mm. I loved drawing. I loved cartooning and that kind of stuff. So obviously, like, the visual aesthetic was a huge thing for me uh, when I first got into the subculture. I loved, I mean, at the time in, in, the, in the mid-90s, it was kind of a interesting time for goth because it was... You got the witchy look, and then you get the unfortunate, sad cyber look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get the, you know, you get you, you, We all remember that yeah. time period, but like, you know, it was like the velvet, the chokers, that kind of stuff. I really gravitated towards that. I also um, always, you know, when I was younger, also had a bit of the gender dysmorphia, mm. uh, and I think I think a lot of us kind of had that, and I think we all kind of, you know, as as a subculture, uh, it was a very welcoming subculture to people that had issues with, you know, gender conformity and uh, no other style of dress kind of really made me feel more at home than goth because you could basically gender bend, which was the term we used back then, um, in in, in a way that was totally acceptable socially. Um, So, you know, I loved everything from frock coats to, uh, and it's funny because now I design like, you know, a coat that uh, is so synonymous with my company um and that was totally born out of my love back then of frock coats mm. and you know the dramatic cuts and that kind of stuff that's so yeah fashion was definitely that's part beautiful. of it <laughs> i love that yeah very cool yeah I, and actually thinking about it my first uh one of my first 
goth pieces was actually a trench coat I took from my grandfather uh, that was dark blue because I couldn't <laughs> find a black one, but it was close enough. So cool. I've got a couple references here, but I feel like the this article, what was this called? It's officially spooky season. Here's how to dress for it like an adult. Um, it opens the article with this really interesting question that I wanted to pose. And essentially the question they ask is, how are we supposed to incorporate elements of uh, bygone styles without becoming a clumsy costume? And I think it's interesting to think about that relating to goth because one of the frustrations with high fashion that I've had and I've heard other people bring up is this idea of runway fashion as being ephemeral, just kind of uh, bringing something back for the here and now and then moving on to something else, whereas goth in general is pretty averse to like thinking of goth as a phase or not supporting um, kind of legacy fashions as part of the culture. So how do you feel about this question of how do we understand runway fashion in a way that's not seen as kind of a costume or dress up? Well, I think it depends on what what runway collections we're talking about. Are we okay, talking yeah. about are, are we talking about like haute couture evening wear? Are we talking about um artistic, you know, Iris Van Herpen type work? Are we talking about Machino who are, you know, take the piss out of every day and are are doing or like, you know, Victor and Rolf that do like, you know, crazy sculptural pieces. Because I think that fashion is a lot like any other art form, much like film. For actually, film would be a really good example. Uh, you you get your experimental films, right? That do really bizarre, interesting things that push film technique. Um, and then you get your blockbuster Hollywood films. And then somewhere in between, you get commercial films that are inspired by experimental films but want to target the demographic of people that watch the blockbuster films, So they kind of meld the two. And I think people kind of forget that fashion kind of operates on the same level. Like mm. haute couture crazy shit isn't supposed to be worn on the street. It's not streetwear, but it informs streetwear. I think, I actually think that's a really good point that I hadn't thought about. Uh, and I think I've been guilty of this is sort of thinking of runway fashion like kind of abstracting it as this is this one uniform thing, but there's it's, I that's probably just me being completely ignorant as I'm sure it makes way more sense as a whole variety of different styles and John gen and like genres and creative types of people. Uh, well, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's a whole art form. So it is yeah. got all the complexity of a full art medium. Um, but a lot of people, because it is so functional and practical seeming in our everyday lives, they just think of it in those terms. And unless they're involved in the fashion industry, it tends to be reduced to that in, in our minds. And that's, I think, where some of the frustration mm -hmm. around the impracticalities of haute couture or the ridiculous amounts of money for these custom branded items are is because of that assumption um, and not letting it be an art form in and of itself. Yeah. I mean, uh, fashion is, is it, it is an art form. And, uh, you know, like uh, uh, my friend Roxy Callahan, who's like very good friends with Vivian Westwood, he was, he's an old school punk. He used to be a backup dancer for, you know, all kinds of bands r rolling through Scotland, you know, back in the 80s. And he had all he has all kinds of crazy stories. And, you know, it's his relationship with Vivian Westwood that informed her work you know, as a couturier, you know, she's punk rock couture, but she rolled with the punks and, you know, Edinburgh in the eighties. Um, so I think, mm. you know, fashion, it, it is, it is art, you know, and I think a lot of people kind of forget that. Um, and they see it as either this fluffy, stupid thing or, mm. or, or a practical necessity or utilitarian or whatever. But, uh, when you get onto the level of like runway shows and, and that kind of experience, then it becomes a little bit, it's a different kind of playing field, you know? Right. So can we maybe sort of um, delineate or explain a bit about the difference between 
like what is hot couture and what is you know these other types of uh high fashion i think my next question was about associating gothic tropes with goth because i tend to see that happening a lot uh with runway shows and stuff like that but what are what are the kind of <laughs> different aspects of high fashion that um would incorporate these kind of elements well goth is you know i hate to say it in in fashion terms but it is a trend and it and it ten, mm. tends to be a trend that works for fall winter because fall winter in terms of clothing where you know it's it's colder out in many places in the world you you are dressing in layers you know everybody loves their fall winter their you know layered looks that kind of thing so goth obviously always falls into that because where when else are you going to wear you know velvet you're not going to wear velvet right. in the summertime sometimes you will but like it's you know uh generally you're you're wearing fabrics that are associated with goth and goth clothing in fall winter so it tends to be a trend that fits every fall winter um the interesting thing about when goth becomes uh fully on trend or you know back in the mainstream is when it becomes a spring summer look and last spring mm. like uh 2019 uh goth was definitely in for this for the spring and summer which i thought was very interesting because i was it was pretty much you know proving that goth was kind of on the upswing um but in terms of breaking down the fashion industry and like so basically you have your two seasons you have your fall winter and you have your spring summer and um, within those, you have different kinds of collections, depending on the size of your company and depending on, you know, the brand that you have. If you're doing outerwear, for example, you don't really have, you're not doing a resort collection, you know, you're doing, you know, you're, you're ready to wear and you're haute couture or whatever, but typically you break it into ready to wear and haute couture. Ready to wear is basically clothing for the street, so street wear. Um, you know, your jeans and your jean jackets or your military style jackets with your, you know, button down blouses or whatever, or your shirts. Uh, and then haute couture is your conceptual work. So the artistic stuff or your fancy evening wear or your bridal wear or that kind of thing. Okay. That's useful because that was, that was one of my confusions around like, how does, because a lot of what I see with high fashion is the conceptual stuff. And I'm always thinking, you know, because I hear people say um, it's a way to it kind of trickles down to department stores and things like that and influences fashion. I don't see like department stores selling fish bowls for headgear and this all this weird shit that you <laughs> see, you know. And so it's like I'm yeah. try, trying to understand how that influences normal people. <laughs> well, that stuff is basically um, it sells the sizzle. Much like, for example, okay. with my business, like, for example, with my business, um, you know, the uh, the corsetry is is what's selling the sizzle of the business. Um, you know, there's a very small demographic of people that buy corsets, right? Mm. Like the people who are buying corsets are Goths, uh, Renaissance fair people. <laughs> uh. <laughs> tight lacers and fetish enthusiasts mm -hmm. so th already themselves are a small 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 demographic of, of people of my customer base certainly not enough of a customer base for me to have a brick and mortar storefront like i do so mm. you know i have other products that i sell uh and i and i create and modular outfits that i create so that people want to you know continue to purchase from my business and if they can't afford a corset but they love the idea of the business they'll purchase something else like a scarf or a coat or a jacket um so you know those fishbowl hats that you were mentioning those are what sell the sizzle of the brand you know mm. everybody looks and associates you know that fishbowl hat with that designer that happens to be trendy and super hip right now and well they can't afford the fishbowl hat because they only made 12 of them for the runway show and they're like you know eighteen thousand dollars each <laughs> <Yeah>. or whatever <laughs> some inflated bullshit fucking price but um they look at that and they're like i want to look like that fishbowl person oh i can't afford that oh but oh my god they have this really cool shoulder bag i'll buy that instead so it's mm. it's kind of all of that the, the hokature is kind of necessary and important in building the name of a brand and building a brand identity Gautier is synonymous with the corset you know with the madonna cones um does Gautier sell many corsets oh hell no you know Gautier right. sells so much right. more of his perfume than anything else so how how do you feel about um 
the use of goth traditionally goth aesthetic signifiers on uh in hot couture or other places worn by models who are there you know they're just models they have no interest in it and that kind of goes back to the feeling of seeing uh of feeling like it's kind of a costume because it's someone wearing this thing that maybe would be goth if a goth was wearing it but it's in a completely different setting and it feels kind of like it's being used for something else that's not related to our thing well i think we need to kind of identify is it goth or is it gothic influenced Mm -hmm. is it a goth is it goth clothing that these models are wearing or, or or are they wearing gothic inspired couture right because mm. I, I mean to me goth clothing is you know seen tried and true seen loved you know uh you know companies that are with brand loyalty with people actually purchasing and wearing that stuff mm-hmm. so you know gothic inspired haute couture i mean models are actors they're their purpose is to sell the product, sell the clothing. So they'll be whatever they're asked to be, you know, if they want to, if they want them to, you know, the designer wants them to be a futuristic robot, David Bowie, you know, whatever they'll do that to sell the garment. So if they want them to be, you know, forest elven Gothic girl, then that's what they, that's their job. (laughs) It should be that, (laughs) you know, they should do that. You know, as a performing artist, you know, I've, I was a circus artist for 18 years. I certainly did a lot of gigs where I wasn't necessarily embodying the 1920s vintage circus aesthetic. I mean, I hate that electro swing crap, but I certainly mm. performed that stuff and made it look good. <laughs> right. I think a lot of the disconnect um, is just with how we value fashion and its mm. place in, in goth community as mm. something that is a form of self-expression. What you wear is a, an outer reflection of who you are. So we're talking in the community, you see somebody wearing clothes and the immediate assumption is you handpicked these out or handcrafted this item from the DIY aesthetic or from mix and match and piecemeal. And it is a reflection of your inner being being expressed visually. Mm. And it becomes an effrontery when you, as you're expressing you're seeing somebody wearing things that from our community have a signifier about your inner life, but they, as far as you understand it, don't have that inner life. They're just embodying it. And that feels like a corruption of the concept of fashion, the meaning of fashion within the, yeah, goth I think subculture. Kate's comparison to acting was actually good though, because I don't think we give the same kind of critique to like Brandon Lee playing the crow or what, like any other kind of goth media character. Uh, so I think that's fair. And actually, so my, when I was trying to think of like a counter argument mm-hmm. to this generally, what I generally thought of was the idea of context and the idea of context being contingent to meaning contingent in the philosophical sense of a a thing is never never means the exact same thing in every place and every time it's never always true or always false it's contingent to context so when we see um goth aesthetic and uh, sartorial idioms on the runway they're in a different context they're not within the sort of how we would understand the musical lineage of goth and the uh, community lineage and 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 the literature and club spaces that were were a part of um so it is something different and it's in a different environment and because of that i don't think it's really i think we could argue it's not really a a threat or whatever that some like a appropriation or whatever that some people would say and i think it's similar to the difference between goth and gothic lolita right because people understand that those are two separate things but they have similar influences of catholicism and whatever victorian uh fashion aesthetics and that kind of thing but they're they're separate and people kind of understand that intuitively well and also who's to say that designers uh who are using gothic influence into their collections 
um, don't come from a place of authenticity. I mean, you look at somebody like Alexander McQueen, um, and he absolutely understood fundamentally what goth mm. was. You know, you look, you you watch any documentary, read any book on on his life or you know, his experiences and his interests and the things that he modeled his work after. He was super, you know, passionate about all the things dark and, you know, and and dreary, <laughs> like, you know, mm. like any goth of the goth subculture. You know, my, my friend Roxy Callahan was a backup dancer for Andy Sex Gang, <laughs> you know, and he oh, was wow. a huge influence on Vivian Westwood. You know, I think um, hmm. I don't think a lot of fashion designers work in a, as much isolation as a lot of people seem to think that they they do. Right. I think another aspect is being careful of um, pegging some aesthetic, some article of clothing or whatever as goth and saying it is and saying it was co-opted from the subculture when it might simply be drawing from the same well. Um, Victorian fashion is a good example of that. Goth mm -hmm. didn't originate Victorian fashion. The Victorians did. We've co-opted that. Other fashions could co-opt that as well. Gothic Lolita is an example of that, as you brought up. Um, also, as mentioned in the article, yeah. um, when I looked at that uh, Moshimo collection or Moshino collection, um, that seemed to be co-opting not goth well. so much as horror and mythology, which also predates goth and is another well from which goth draws. But goth does not have a monopoly on horror archetypes or the concept of horror even so there is a danger of looking at something drawing from the same well and saying oh that's co-opting goth when it's just co-opting something that goth, well, goth also is a subculture predicated upon popular culture for young gener like a young generation of people young young kids so obviously there's going to be they're going to be drawing from a well that is you know in the minds of the masses like the Mosh the Moschino uh collection you mentioned um I mean they're historically that brand is known for being the kitschy brand they're the camp brand so you know if they're going to do mm. a horror camp themed collection of course they're gonna you know draw upon you know that spider webby things and that kind of kitschy aesthetic mm. That makes sense. Yeah. So when I was when I'm thinking about these kind of these distinctions between, I think I had a couple of questions about like, well, what's the difference between that and Parm, what Parma Ham does, or what's the difference between high concept designers and yourself or Cambriel? It's not necessarily uh, that you're you're just not doing the same thing, and but they kind of get lumped in together because they have similar influences. Uh, do they really though? I mean, like the uh, obviously the people who are purchasing from companies like mine or Cambriel or any of the other like goth, you know, created brands, um, mm -hmm. they they understand our impulse, right? Like when you are functioning, living, working, living, breathing, DJing, attending events in in the goth scene, you have an impulse that is authentic and you understand the the you understand where it comes from so when you're creating your fashion or your work or whatever you're creating from a place of genuine enthusiasm and an understanding whereas mm. you know these these big fashion brands are just looking from the outside in so they're kind of seeing functionally what works on on the surface mm. and so they don't really have the heart you know i don't see you know um Betsy Johnson being a huge trend in the goth scene, you know, I don't see Machino right. being a huge trend in the goth scene because goths know their product. They know their mm. artists. They know people who channel what they, what they want to see in their clothes. I think anyway, I hope. So, so uh, this other, if we start getting, and you kind of brought this up earlier, but if we start getting into this idea of, like I think you mentioned, like oh, this piece could be eighteen thousand dollars or whatever. How does the how does a kind of goth influenced look that is so astronomically expensive is that fair to do that when it's based on this like DIY ethos and you know people doing their own thing and selling stuff cheap? I had that example of that uh, uh, printed uh, button down shirt that's a thousand dollars. On, on that website. A lot of the fashion designers that I looked up sell 
what appears to me to be very simple garments at insane prices. Whereas if I bought it from somebody like you or, or whoever, it would be far less expensive and like handmade by somebody that's part of the scene. I think that's relative because a lot of people um, who don't understand how slow fashion works, for example, have accused me of mm. being too expensive um, because, you know, we See, make I everything thought, by hand. <laughs> I've, I, I've, looked, I, I've looked through all your stuff and I thought it was completely uh, reasonable and actually kind of inexpensive for what it is, to be honest. Thank you. Uh, we, we try very hard to uh, appeal to everybody. Um, but I mean, that's the thing. It's all relative. Um, yeah, it's 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 interesting because to me, I always found goth to be the more um, affluent cousin to punk. You know, mm. when I was when I was in school, um, you know, I was I, I you know I grew up in a poor neighborhood and I was you know kind of a poor kid, but I went to a high school where there was quite a lot of affluent kids, and a lot of the affluent kids that were you know were goth had a lot of money to spend on their clothing. Um, so I think when a big fashion house kind of creates a really ridiculously expensive goth piece, I think they're kind of possibly making a, you know, nod to that, that it is kind of an upper middle class subculture. I mean, let's be honest here. We'd, <laughs> if, if we were, you know, if it was a poor subculture, it would be more in line with the gutter punks, you know. More DIY on that on that end. Uh, yeah, a lot of I mean, goths well, there are. <laughs> you know, in the '90s, they were they were expensive clothes stores for goths in the '90s. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are. I think we think about. Go ahead. I think we think about it like in the in the '80s when goth was just you know rejoining and you know they were uh, everybody was doing DIY because they couldn't. There was no designers making cool stuff. But by the '90s, there were designers making cool stuff, and they were charging a lot more than I am now for my product. And the other side of some of those, you know, in, you know, as you express it, overly inflated priced designer goods, it's usually limited run collections that are being sold more as collector items than as day-to-day -day wear for the rich. And it's the same arguments that's levied at modern art a lot of the time, right? You get a big canvas, you paint it red, and it goes for $100,000. And you're like, well, why can't I just get some canvas and wood and paint it red and get $100,000 out of that? What's what's fair about that? What makes that so special when I could have done it and they are getting all this money? And one thing that I've always loved, I don't know if it was a meme back in the late 90s, or early 2000s, there was this thing that went around with which was concepts expressed as mathematical equations. And my very favorite one has always been modern art equals I could do that plus, yeah, but you didn't. And there's something about the concept of idea and limited run, and also a lot of those items that are sold for really high amounts of money aren't just the aesthetic, it's also the materials they're using. They're usually using very expensive cottons and silks and really rare dyes and things like that, which for us who can't afford that, it doesn't really matter, but to someone who's a collector, it might. And you know, market prices are what mm. the market will bear, and if someone's willing to pay for it, that's what they're going to charge. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard with 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 how the fashion industry has changed so much in terms of how manufacturing is done. I'd like to be idealistic and think that way. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily true. You know, a lot of fashion houses now piece out their products to various different factories and then finish the garment, say, in Italy, and then they can say it's made in Italy when it was probably not entirely made in Italy um, mm -hmm. to cut down costs. Um, I think a lot of it just has to do with the brand recognition. You know, um, yeah. you get a big name like Dior, you can charge whatever the hell you want because you've funneled that much money into your marketing. Um, you know, when we're talking about the one-off haute couture gowns, absolutely, those are all handmade and they're ateliers with expensive materials and that kind of thing. But a thousand-dollar dress shirt is no better than a one-hundred-dollar dress shirt, even if it's using the finest materials. If it's sold at a ready-to-wear price, like if it's sold as ready-to-wear, and that's the unfortunate reality. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was definitely thinking more about those one-of-a-kind you know, Hook Contour was worn on the runway or that limited run of 12 fishbowl hats that you mentioned before. <laughs> right. um, that's more what I was thinking of when I was talking about 
that sort of collection piece, high quality materials. But you're right. There's definitely that very sketchy middle ground where it's leaning on the name, it's leaning on that brand. And yeah, it's pieced out to various sweatshops or masks. Not, maybe not that bad, but oh, maybe also that bad, but certainly not as high quality as it's certainly selling itself as by leaning on its on its name and the brand recognition. So, so Kate, do you do you feel like then that um, fewer people in the goth community care about DIY or do or like go to a thrift store and grab something and modify it themselves? You feel like it's a more people are just buying stuff online. Um, I don't know. You know, it's it's interesting because the 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 pendulum of you know uh consumer uh habits is is changing so dramatically right now especially in in the wake mm. of the conversation surrounding you know climate change i'm noticing a huge mm. huge growth in um clothing swaps happening and diy you know people DIYing their own garments or fixing old things and mending them, um, things that like people wouldn't have done 10 years ago. Um, I'm seeing so many of my friends talking about mending old dresses that they got from goth stores back in the day because they want to bring new life to them, which I think is awesome. Mm. Um, I think DIY is an integral and necessary part of our subculture because it what it's what facilitates the movement forward of aesthetics you know because aesthetics are changing we're dressing differently now than we did 10 years ago than we did 15 years ago um so i think diy will always inform that um fast fashion habits unfortunately are still strong with the online purchasing but hopefully you know the tide is changing on that because you know uh it was interesting an article came out about a about two or three weeks ago um that basically exposed how any company you order off online and you send a return to that it's cheaper for that product to be thrown in a landfill than it is to be restocked which i've been saying for years mm. um and i've been <laughs> literally telling my friends for years stop buying two or three items and sending them back because they're just going to landfill but now that it's become a mainstream common knowledge from this article that everybody was sharing on the internet um hopefully it will inform people's decisions and how they purchase with online you know retailers um you know, it's it's funny because actually um, my friend Laura um, from Cat vs. Bat and I are launching a um, like a T-shirt label uh, this year. And oh, awesome. one of the yeah, uh, it's going to be super cool. Um, very fun, like very, you know, it's obviously very goth inspired, <laughs> goth bent. Mm -hmm. um, so it, like fun graphics and that kind of stuff. And our mandate when we when we decided to to come up with this label was uh, we wanted it to be produced within Canada. We wanted it to be small batch productions. We didn't want to be doing like, you know, huge amounts of this or that. Um, and we want to do small limited collection, just see how it goes. Um, and, you know, it's been it's been a fun journey kind of collaborating on this project together um but also it's we just wanted to create an alternative if you're gonna if you want to buy t-shirts and if you want to buy you know quote-unquote fast fashion at least you can do it ethically you can you can be mm -hmm. producing garments in canada making them locally doing small batch runs not making large volumes to be able to sell them at a reasonable price um, so I think we're, we're kind of launching this project as a, as a, as a, as proof that you can do that, you know, without having to mm. be doing all these giant orders and that kind of stuff, because I think that's where you get into big problems with volume production, because where does that volume product go when you don't sell it, you know? That's fantastic. And yeah, that's a good point because it's it's like unless a brand is based around the idea of ethical consumption, you don't really know what's going on. So I was thinking of um ThreadUp, I know is a uh subscription service and there's like or no, ThreadUp is like a online thrift store kind of thing. Stitch Fix is a sub, but there's like all kinds of clothing subscription services and they're not really going to tell you what the environmental impact of it is unless it's the brand is based around being ethical in, in what they do. And I, I, I do see a lot more uh, consideration around that, around what is 
what impact is this having on the planet, especially among goths? And I guess that kind of, um, from what I've seen in a large part, revolves around Killstar because I think Killstar is like the most recognizable, like, uh, ready made goth fashion uh, brand online. But I, I, I don't personally know anything about what their, you know, ethics are behind any of that. Um, Oh, they're absolutely so, fast fashion given their price point. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, as to their ethics, I can't comment on that because I really don't know too much about their business. But I mean, any fast fashion brand, unless it's built into their business model, you know, where they are very transparent about their chain of efficacy, you can mm. pretty much guarantee it's not ethical. Like, sure. You know, like for example, with my company, my chain of efficacy is very short, you know, um, my purchase, I purchased my materials locally. Everything is made in Canada to the best of my abilities to purchase all my leathers. I source from indigenous hunters from the communities in Northern Ontario. Um, mm. all of the samples are made in house by me or an assistant. Um, and then all of our product is either made in house, uh, or through a small batch manufacturer in Toronto that I can invite any of my customers to go to, you know? Um, mm. So, you know, that is an extraordinarily short chain of, <laughs> of, of command there. Um, but then when you get into like, for example, t-shirt printing, when we, when we were mm, kind yeah. of going through our, with our process starting this company, you know, you're like, cool. So there's a print. Okay. So here's a printer over here. They print everything locally. Where do they get their t-shirts from? Oh, well, their T-shirts are coming from mass production, you know, mass bulk production from China. OK, well, there we go. There's there goes the chain of efficacy there. And then, well, here's this printer. OK, so great. So they make all their. Oh, wow. This is very expensive now. So now each T-shirt is going to yeah. cost like ridiculous. And then y yeah. you kind of go through the whole, you know, process trying to find your your chain of efficacy. Um, and y y you can go crazy, you know, by trying to be as ethical as you can, like, for example, with Bone and Busk, you know, we uh, we have a very short chain of efficacy. And as a result, our prices are quite a lot higher than I would like them to be for some of our products. But they just are what they are because they have to be because that's what's sustainable for, you know, our staff and and for, you know, our suppliers. Well, see, I feel like there has been a shift in um the way that goths shop because like when i was buying stuff in the 2000s um it was mostly victorian stuff but i was buying clothing from the person who was selling it was the person that was making it it wasn't mass production and yeah you paid more for it but it was really good quality and you knew that the person making it was part of the scene and the money was going back into that and into you were supporting somebody in the community whereas now that we've had uh now that we have these big recognizable brand names that are selling alternative and goth clothing for lower amounts of money, people are like, Oh, it's easy to buy and it's cheap. And I can, I can buy a bunch of those. And I feel like there was a, a huge shift in, um, because when I was in the two thousands, I wasn't even really buying clothing, thinking about the ethics of it. I was just like, it's cool that I'm supporting somebody in the community. And I know that they made my clothing. Um, and I feel like now that's kind of become a, a bigger problem for alternative communities because it is so easy to buy a quarter of the price, you know, knock off Victorian gown or whatever it's going to be. Yeah, but, but you also have to understand that the landscape has changed. And, um, you know, back in the 90s and the early 2000s, we didn't really have the internet access that we do now. You know, it was, yeah. we didn't have the access. Like I remember, um, I actually worked for a goth designer, uh, when I was a teenager and that's kind of, that opened my, my brain to the idea of, of basically having a custom clothing business because I saw that business model and was excited by it because, you know, she would go mm -hmm. do these trade shows and all these goths would show up and buy from her. And I just thought it was the coolest thing, you know, being part of this small, cool Toronto indie business. Um, I felt like I was part of something. Um, and I really wanted to recapture that with my business when I, when I, you know, started taking Bone and Busk seriously full time and making it, you know, my full time job. Uh, and as I was doing that, I realized that the climate has just changed completely. 
you know, because now that you have, you know, all this easy, readily accessible, and I mean, you can go on AliExpress and find, you know, mm. companies making gothic dresses in really horrible, plasticky smelling fabrics, but they look good for that photo shoot or they look good for that club night. Um, and people just lap it up because a, you know, we are living in tough economic times. So people don't have the, you know, the, the, the money to spend on stuff and B, you know, scenes are changing and, you know, growing and dying and mutating. And so we don't really have the centralized scenes that we necessarily did back then. I know Toronto in the nineties was kind of one of the craziest places to be for goth. You know, we held when we had convergence, you know, mm. at the big bop, I remember it being this huge deal and we all planned our outfits for the week. And that just doesn't really happen anymore. You know, in, in North America, definitely in Europe, it does. Um, but it, you know, that's just not happening here anymore. So people are less willing to invest. And I think they're more focused on supporting the scene in other ways, you know, um, mm. you know, I get more people excited about me DJing than coming to my store, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, so I think you- it's, it, yeah, I think it's just a changing, changing habits. Yeah. Do you feel like um I was going to say so Instagram, but I guess social media in general and the constant presentation and bombardment of uh people in a like super well put together and constantly changing outfits has kind of pressured people to feel that they need to buy as many things as they possibly can rather than buy quality pieces that are going to last for like 40 years because they want to try and keep up with the image that they're seeing or is that do you think that's like a straw man i guess see i don't know because that's not what i foster with my business um Mm. because of the way my business ethics are we don't produce a lot of you know pieces we produce 26 pieces per unit per thing per season because we don't believe in waste so i don't attract that clientele my clientele comes to me for you know they're they they want a really well-made corset or they want uh that amazing dress that they saw on our instagram or that kind of thing um so i don't really the 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 people who are going to be buying and throwing away clothes for insta photo shoots aren't really my customer um right so i don't i can't really talk to i I can't attest to any of that yeah fair enough (laughs) Fair enough. I kind of wanted to go right back to the okay. beginning because we had that question at the very beginning um, from the article, and I don't know if it was really actually answered. So, you know, what would be a good way for somebody outside the scene or somebody in high fashion to evoke the language or the ideas of the gothic aesthetic in fashion as an element of fashion without it coming off as commodification or coming off as just tropey costume trying to ape another look what what are the elements that you can bring into a fashion design that doesn't come off as that sort of thing well i think it would probably be just draw upon the same influences that we did um you know like i think some you had mentioned earlier about um you know victorian clothing mm-hmm. be influenced by that be influenced by sacred dress of people culturally around the world um certain ideologies what would a nihilist wear that kind of thing all of the things that are you know goths are attracted to find those impulses take them and abstract them you know um i think i i do want to touch on actually you had somebody had mentioned something about cultural appropriation <laughs> of goth mm-hmm. and i i kind of want to just make a little kind of comment about that because I find the, uh, the concept of culturally appropriating a subculture really bizarre and icky, um, yeah. <laughs> especially yeah. when we're talking about, you know, a, a term that's used to describe, you know, marginalized people who have been literally, their cultures have been stolen for profit by fashion designers mm-hmm. like indigenous clothing and, uh, you know, regalia and, you know, 
formal wear and that kind of thing. I just want to put it out there that I don't think it's the same thing uh, with fashion designers being influenced by a subculture, by goth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with that. I did remember I did have something else I wanted to ask you briefly about just the idea of the term goth being applied to uh, fashion lines by fashion media rather than by the community making it and is there a disconnect there my brain went to uh music journalists calling a band like pale waves goth or something like that just because they kind of look because they wear black or whatever like is that a problem is there a disconnect between the reporting and the community around the fashion uh i i don't i don't know about that i think it i think it is i think it's there's just a lack of uh of of I guess understanding or or reverence for the term the way that I guess we have for the term, but really do we even because look at Andrew Eldritch, you know, <laughs> like oh my god, I'm not a goth, you know. Um I think that yeah. um I think that the term yeah, goth is uh it's a ubiquitous term that I don't think we really have a you know, I think the subculture has a precious understanding of, but I don't I don't think the mm. rest of the world kind of treats as preciously as we do. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, almost always the case when it comes to cultures or subcultures, when it comes to the things that that culture itself values and the things that the people on the outside of that culture see as a cultural signifier and want to co-opt for whatever reason, whether it's to reference the culture or some capital that that cultural representation brings or as a way of critiquing it, you know, any of that sort of thing, there is definitely this outsider versus insider view. And the outsider view is almost always going to seem reductive and somewhat insulting to the insider who views that as a valuable element of their culture or subculture and something that's inherent in their identity. Yeah. Yep. So my last kind of question here with, then was, what do you make of the argument I see online about goth being just music and that you don't have to dress goth <laughs> to be goth. Uh, you only have to listen to goth music. It has nothing to do with goth. Like, how do you feel about that? Oh no, I feel baited now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh God, the DJ in me says it's all about the music, but then the fashion designer in me says it's about the fashion too. Um, I think with any subculture, it's the marriage between the aesthetic yeah. and the music and the ideologies and the literature that make it for what it is. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's all interdependent. I don't think it's one, I like, I mean, uh, I mean, I would I would agree that it is I mean from a musical standpoint from a ethno musicological yeah. you know you know historical perspective that yes it is a subculture derivative or that was derived from music um but I think aesthetic informs all of it because you look at and I think I actually mentioned this in an, in the Cat versus Bat podcast how fashion you know, is an important part of musical expression because it gives you codes and signifiers for, you know, the artists like David Bowie and Prince and, you know, artists that are using the flamboyant of costume to support their musical material. I think fashion will always be interdependent with music. So I will say it is all working together independently. So what I was thinking, I just sort of thought of this today as I was reading the show notes, but possibly one of the best counterexamples I could think of, or I guess counter arguments I could think of to that is, um, okay, so maybe we are a holy music subculture. So as a holy music subculture, how do we share with one another? How do we gather? Well, we gather at concerts, we gather at club nights, places where the music is played. Those are events, those are spaces, those are our gathering spaces as a music subculture. Now, what happens in those spaces with a bunch of goths together enjoying their music when somebody comes in who doesn't look the part? How do they react? Without even asking them about music, they're not asking about their knowledge of music, they just look at the person walking in the door in the sports jersey. You know, do they react positively or negatively? You know, 
does that say that fashion has an influence on their reaction as a culture? Yeah. Never. I've never seen that happen before. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely no clubs with dress codes yeah, or no, anything no. like that. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I it, always found it kind of endearing when that one guy, you know, who's wearing the polo shirt is fist pumping to front 242. You know, I'm like, mm-hmm. I want to be that guy's friend. <laughs> oh, I love it too. But the majority of people seem to be, in my experience, affronted by it when somebody doesn't look the part as well as fit in. Well, I think and mostly it's just because it's easier to tell that, or it's easier to think you can tell that they don't belong by just seeing them across the room than having an in-depth conversation about do they know these bands and do they know this music and can they sing the lyrics? Well, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but like, I know for me, having been a goth going through the Columbine thing, um, going mm. to the goth clubs was a safe space for people who were dressed yeah. like freaks back in the day. And if somebody who was dressed normally walked into the club, our immediate response was, oh my God, are they going to pick a fight with somebody or are they going to assault somebody? You know? So mm-hmm. I think yeah. we kind of back then we had a little bit more of a more f- afraid for our safety than, oh my God, who's that person wearing a polo shirt? Like, I think it was a little bit more, um, the fear was a little bit more realistic back then. I don't know if it translates into now. I don't know what, what the, what the young kids feel now when somebody who's older and dressed in, you know, quote unquote, normal people clothes walks into a club, how they react to, or why they react now the way they do. I'd say it's from what I've seen from people nowadays, because I also was through the the Columbine area as well. Um, I'd say there's a similar reaction, but for very different reasons. And now it's circling around the concepts of rape culture and and some of that. When somebody comes into your safe space, especially nowadays when it comes, has, it has behavioral aspects as well, where the, the person who doesn't belong comes up and starts grinding against random people or the ob- object, as mentioned on uh, just the podcast we recorded the other night, the the trope of the big titty goth girlfriend and and trying to get you one of those as, you know, a non-goth just going in and, I mean, that's always been the trope even back in the 80s and 90s. The Anybody who's alternative doesn't need to be need to be goth. Someone with piercings or tattoos is, at least when they're female, are equated with being easy and a good mark for that sort of thing. And so that's always been that undercurrent of danger when somebody who doesn't look like they belong the part, you know, are they a predator? So, yeah, I think that's always been the case. There was that uptick around the Columbine era when there was a huge upswing in violence and anger and whatever towards people who look like the Columbine shooters to whatever degree. Um, but, yeah, it's still there. And now with the the Me Too movement and rape culture right now, that's, I think, kind of the locus of it currently. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Yeah, and then from my part, like thinking about that question in a more in the way I think about things philosophically, and I've always argued that I that based essentially what you said, Kate, is is that the music and the aesthetic are interrelated, and I don't think you can like I feel like goth itself as a culture is a multitude. It's a I've used the word homology before, but it's a, a number of different things coming together, and I don't think you can necessarily separate. Uh, fashion or aesthetic and music from one another in any meaningful way because they're so uh reciprocally related they're so, they're they're almost uh, coextensive in a sense uh that that if you separate them um it becomes an intellectual exercise it's an abstraction the two things don't mean the same thing that they meant together and um i know I'm not a, a big fan of these dichotomies and Trey you've you've said you're not a fan of dichotomies either. It goes back to how we understand the body as well, the outside versus the inside. I don't think those are distinct entities that we are because we are embodied that we are our sense of self relates to our body and our actions in the material world that's how we kind of manifest how we see ourselves that this idea of um music versus fashion or um skin as like this hard boundary 
where you have observers on one side and an agent on the other side that it's 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 a very western idea of identity and so i i tend to see things as a web of interaction and this sort of bringing forth of all of these things together through material action and through being embodied and through uh actually doing these things or like maybe performativity if you've read judith butler that kind of thing um so I yeah I don't think I think this idea of goth is only music and it's never had it's it's never used the influence of any other artistic form ever is is uh, a bit silly. So I don't know. So we all agree on that then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think in general I don't I mean I don't I don't know if I have a good reason why but just thinking about music and various music cultures and styles and genres there seems to be some intimate and almost inextricable link between music and physical appearance, oftentimes in mm -hmm. fashion, but I'm struggling to think of any musical genre that if I name it, an immediate look mm -hmm. doesn't come to mind. Some sort of clothing, some sort of aesthetic, whether it's hairstyles or clothing or types of hats or mm -hmm. something, but almost any musical genre I can think of, there's a look associated with it. And I I don't know why that is. It's an interesting thing to think about, but there is something that ties music and, and appearance together. I'm sure someone will send me an email about something. <laughs> that would be great. I'd, I'd actually love someone to give me a good example because I'm struggling you know. to think of a musical uh, style yeah. or genre or, well, or culture that doesn't it's like, have a corresponding look. It's like haute couture. It's all about brand identity. Um, you, you, you want to have mm -hmm. uniformity within the brand. Uh, you want to have a uniform look. Yeah. Cool. So Kate, thank you so much for your time. Please let us know where we can find your stuff online or in person. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's been awesome being on here. You can find us at www.boneandbusk.com on Instagram at Bone and Busk Couture. And on the Facebook as Bone and Busk Couture. And our shop is at 1616 Queen Street West in downtown Toronto, Canada. Very fucking cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. This was cool. a, a lot of fun for me. One thing that I'd like to, to add, or I guess a request or something that you know, maybe all of us could come up with that we could add to the show notes for everybody's benefit, mm -hmm. mostly mine because I'm a little selfish. Can we get a list of resources for good? fashion brands, good independent producers of fashion that we can all look up that will be uh, a counterexample to your kill stars that, you know, yeah. if I wanted to go look for something, hey, here's a good list of, of clothiers that I could go to, whether they're, you know, ethically sourced, but more mass manufacturer at a cheaper level, or whether it's the bespoke style, any of that, just a good resource that we could add um, for people who are interested in moving away from the fast fashion addictions. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely give you, um, um, I can shoot you guys uh, a few links to quite a few companies that I know of personally that do good, cool alternative clothing. I'll That'd think about great. that as well. And yeah, I can put those like down at the bottom as, as references uh, for anyone who wants to do further searching. Kate, thank you again so much for joining us on today's episode. And special thanks to everyone who supports us over at patreon.com slash cemetery confessions. If you would like to continue this conversation with myself and with our wonderful community, you can uh, head over to our Patreon page and sign up at the bottom level. You will get access to our discord server. That's going to do it for today. In two weeks, we will be back again with Another Goth Talk episode, we're going to be chatting with Cliff and Ivy, who are from Alaska's only goth band, uh, discussing a whole broad range of subjects, and I think that's going to be a really fun one. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, stay dark. The preceding program is a member of The Belfry, a network of blogs, podcasts, and videos for the darkly inclined. Go to thebelfry.rip for more information.
Otherwise, yeah, there's no rules about swearing or anything, so... Uh, Heavens to Murgatroyd, I thought your viewers would be horrified by my use of scurrilous idiom. <laughs>